So, uh, Mason, first off, thanks for doing this. Uh, Mason George from Mason George Motorcycles. I love origin stories. I love figuring out how people get started in all these motorcycles because they're always so interesting. So what was your your first motorcycle or what got you into it? You know, I was um, I was obsessed with motorcycles like ever since I can remember. And my first motorcycle, I got when I was a little kid, but I didn't really ride it because I think I was maybe five years old, six years old, was a RM50. And I'm from the Midwest, and it was one of those things like it was out in someone's front yard for cheap. Um, but it was a full-on like kid's motocross bike, and I had never ridden before. So my first bike that I actually rode a lot was a Manco mini bike with a three and a half horsepower motor in it. Um, and I moved up from there, but I, my parents weren't super into motorcycles. My mom actually right. was more into bikes than my dad. She grew up riding. My grandpa bought her and my aunts and uncle uh, mini bikes from like the Sears catalog back in the mm -hmm. day. And she rides now, my mom rides now. She has a Harley, super cool. But, wow. um, you know, I grew up on a farm without a lot of money, so I yeah. kind of got into three-wheelers because in the 90s, three-wheelers were practically worthless. So it was what I could afford because they were basically free. Um, in fact, yeah. a friend of mine and I did get one for free. It was like so in someone's yard, and they're like, just take it, you know? So yeah. that kind of got me going, and the older bike stuff is just – you know what it was they were cheap so that's kind of how i got into yeah. older bikes as a, as a little kid um and then it just took off from there and i went to mmi after school and you know got into the motorcycle industry and yeah. that's uh yeah one one thing leads to another you know when, yeah. when you think about about three wheelers in the 90s because that was the the end of them right the four wheelers started coming out the late 80s uh, well, middle yeah. late 80s, I guess, four wheelers and the death trap of the three wheeler. So, if parents had one in their yard or in their garage, they're like, get rid of this thing before it kills my kids. Totally. Yeah. The, the last year that they were sold in the United States was 1986. There's a few yeah. very extremely rare models, 1987 models, but 86 was kind of the last year. And if you look at the production numbers, like 86 was a lot less. And yeah, the four wheeler thing took off. Um, Honda only made the 250R four wheeler for four years, and even today, it is like the staple, like quad as far as handling and power and all that stuff. But basically, every aftermarket quad is based on that geometry still, and people and they're still super sought after and competitive today. It, yeah, it's, it's wild. You know, it, it's so funny when, when you talk about that. It's such a small world, this this motorcycle uh, kind of community, especially when you're talking about old motorcycles. I um, I found a Honda C200. Now I live in Louisiana, just outside of New Orleans. I found mm -hmm. a Honda C200 on Marketplace for like 200 bucks. And I go to the place to pick it up, and it's in a place, it's in a town called Cutoff, Louisiana. So Louisiana looks like a boot and it's got this little little tendrils that kind of skirt off into the Gulf of Mexico. And that's kind of where cutoff is. It's out in the middle of nowhere, out towards the the end of the river, kind of the, the swamp and the Gulf of Mexico meet. And I pull up at this place and it looks like a motorcycle shop. And it ends up being the name of the place is DNA Restorations. And they restore three wheelers and send them all over the world. So is that... Travis then? Travis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. he's the man. That's why I knew yeah. Cutoff, because I was like, I know right. that name for some reason. Yeah. But yeah, Travis is uh, you know, his stuff is world class. Um yeah. I'm sure you've seen that the guy, uh Binky's ATV World. Uh, yeah. I think he's done a lot of bikes for him and you know, yeah, that whole that whole scene is taking off now and I love it. I'm I'm super excited about it, and it's it's great. You know, a lot of the the older guys that were into it in the '90s are a little bit 
butthurt about the prices, um, right. especially during COVID, which that has drastically changed in the last year and a half. Prices are have super corrected. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, I get it. Like, but, you know, it is what it is. It's like the more people that are into it, the better in my eyes. Yeah. Um, it's better for the sport overall. And then, yeah. you know, aftermarket companies have popped up in the last handful of years that are yeah. starting to make parts for these machines. Yeah. And, you know, there was such a void for such a long time and no interest um, for something that I, I'm super into. I love it. I'm like, I'm yeah. stoked. Yeah, you know, talking about Travis. And it's such a small world because – I never would have expected this, right? And you wouldn't expect it to be in the middle of nowhere and cut off and then pull up. They manufacture their, their own tires. They have their yes. own tires manufactured. They make tanks. They make all kinds of stuff. And, and it's, it's insane, but it's a great space. And to be able to have that, we happen to own uh, one of the few non-Honda three-wheelers. Oh, like a Yamaha? <laughs> a tri -Zero? We have a... We no, we have a, a Kawasaki KLT two fifty. Oh yeah, the KLT. Yeah, those are super yeah. cool. Um, yeah. a lot of people don't know this, and I didn't know it probably for a long time. But Polaris actually made a three wheeler, and oh, wow. I'd like I'd like to get my hands on one someday, just because yeah. they're so oddball. Um, like I don't think you know performance wise and all that they weren't great. Polaris didn't start making good ATV stuff for a long time, so. Yeah. That was, uh, they were, you know, learning back then, but they're just oddball. And I, the only place that I've really seen them pop up for sale is Minnesota. Um, oh, cause wow. I look all over and yeah, I found more, more of them in Minnesota than anywhere, but, um, oh. I think, you know, they're made out that way. So that makes sense. Yeah. And, yeah. And I wonder if it, if it was the three, the, the snowmobiles, cause they made, they probably made snowmobiles first, right? Oh Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and then so they had a market. And in the Midwest, they had dealers for snowmobiles. Yep. So that may have been the, the easy transition. Yeah. And then, they, you know, their customer base, because if yeah. you own a Polaris snowmobile, you're more way more likely to buy a, their yeah. three-wheeler than if you were a Honda guy and you went and looked at it and be like, yeah. So, well, let's talk about that little hidden gem you got uh, back behind you. Yeah. You know, Top Gun. Yep, that's the uh, 1985 Ninja 900 GPZ 900. I guess it's it's called Bolt that year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got that bike in a package deal. It's a super neat motorcycle. It's a one owner bike, and the guy had he spent probably just as much money popping it up as the bike cost when it was new. Wow. Um, it's got PM wheels on it, which I didn't even know PM made a lot of Japanese stuff back then. Because, wow. excuse me, um, nowadays, you know, it's all Harley stuff. So, yeah, yeah it's got PM wheels. It's got a Weissco 973 big bore kit with stage wow. three mega cams and uh, <laughs> CR carburetors. Um, and then a bunch of little stuff, steering stabilizer. I, don't know, I can't remember if the rear shocks are aftermarket or not stainless lines like it's you know all the all the doodads at the time and um it only has fourteen thousand miles i'm pretty sure wow. so yeah it um like i said a one owner machine i got it from the original owner and he um he ran into some health issues a while back and he had to stop riding so it was garage kept and all that but it has been sitting and it i did get it running it does run but it's going to need some fine tuning and that kind of deal. And I think my plan with that one is I'm actually going to be listing that one uh, next week. Um, oh, as, wow. basically, as basically it's a running project for somebody. Mm -hmm. um, there's a ton of potential for the bike and it's clean title, all that good stuff. So it's, it's yeah. a really great bike, but I have a couple big things that I'm working on and I need the space and I just don't have mm -hmm. the time um, to, to go through it the way, you know, because for me, it would be vapor blasting all the aluminum, yeah. polishing everything out, yeah. like, you know, do tires, that kind of thing. Um, and and that, that'll be great. I'd rather sell it to somebody for less money, know it's going to go to a yeah. good home and then 
love that. It's I got it to a good point where at least we know the motor's solid and all that. Yeah. So yeah, that yeah. that's a really really neat motorcycle. The my next chapter in my motorcycle career here is uh, with a company called Moto Nexus. And oh wow. Yeah. So that's kind of what uh, one of the things I've transitioned into here. Uh, Moto Nexus was started by my good friend Clay Baker. And it's it, this has been a couple of years in the making. And basically, mm -hmm. uh, we are a motorcycle auction website for people to sell their motorcycles on. Oh, similar sure. to some other websites that are out there that like there's like bring a trailer. They're right. very much car focused. And we are going to list certain maybe hot rods or specialty cars, right. but not a lot. We're, we're mainly focused on motorcycles and power sports. Yeah. Um, but we actually have software that we've developed for evaluating motorcycle values oh. so like vintage especially vintage motorcycles so we can we can pull a lot of data from the internet and and completed auctions and whatnot and get a really good idea of what these bikes are worth yeah. um and our our platform is really cool i'm i'm excited to share it with you it's like yeah like I said, this is a long time in the making and Clay has put a ton of work and time into this. And there's, you know, engineers overseas making the site and all this. And yeah. We worked out all the bugs and all that good stuff. And we're ready to, we're actually launching um, this week. And awesome. our, our site is, it's really uh, cool for many reasons, but as a seller, um, where I have a lot of experience as a, I have a lot of experience, I guess, as a buyer as well, but as a seller, <laughs> we've kind of uh, eliminated a lot of the frustrations that happen with trying to sell vintage motorcycles online. Basically with vintage motorcycles, you, you don't want to sell them locally. If you happen to find somebody local, that's going to buy them yeah. fine and dandy, but you're to get the most money you want, you need a bigger yeah. audience of at least nationwide. So and you also need to get paid for the motorcycle when it sells. Right. And that is a huge problem when it comes to the main place that people think about selling their motorcycles. And I've, I've been using that site since 2005, and I still do parts mm -hmm. on there, not right. nearly as much as I used to um, because of the fees and everything else. Right. But when it comes to selling motorcycles, if you look, there's barely anything listed um because people are they're over it out of the last six motorcycles i listed only and that sold only one of them actually got paid for because wow it's the wild west you can yeah. you can't you know you can't leave negative yeah. feedback for buyers and <clears throat> excuse me buyers don't even have to have feedback to bid on anything that they want so our site is a lot more secure than that when to bid you have to sign up just like any other site, but we also do yep. a a whole a five hundred dollar hold on your credit card to bid to eliminate all those scam bidders that have no intention yep. of paying and that are at at best going to try to steal your bike and at worst yep. more, you know. Yeah. Um. Yep. So yeah, we're we're really excited about it, and I I think um I think a lot of people are going to enjoy using it. You know, you, you hit it on the head, with, and, and there's a, a couple of things. First off, you've got to expand your market that, that you're selling in. If if you're selling, and, and you got to get in front of people that are knowledgeable about what you're selling, right? So that they, mm -hmm. so that you get the value in it. Because I love the I love the post in Facebook groups, or in, in, and I love that it could be a a Ninja Nine Hundred group, and people, and if you <laughs> if you listed it for sale for seven thousand dollars. People on there are going to just crush it. Like, no way it's worth that. But hold on. This is what your motor, this is, you, you're into these motorcycles. You should support it. Just like if my neighbor sells their house, I want them to sell it for $200,000 more than mine. You I know, tie stays all ships. That's it. Sell it for as much as you can get it, man. That's what I want. But yeah. but it's like on those groups when people are stop talking about it, they go, it more it's more like they're not looking at what should I value mine at, but they're looking at I want to lowball you so I can try to buy it off you. That, That's uh, what it seems like, you know. This motorcycle right here, mm -hmm. 1989 Honda CR500. That is 
those bikes to a T. <clears throat> they used to be really cheap, right? Yep. Everyone was scared of them. They weren't really worth a lot of money. And then, yeah, when prices yeah. went up, oh my goodness, did people get upset about it? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> It's crazy. But going back to your point, talking about the restoration, right? It, and knowing kind of it, it, you have to be disciplined in knowing when you're going to be finished before it comes to a, a point of diminishing returns. Yeah. Right. And you got to move it on. Let the next guy have it. And I don't mind leaving room for the next guy to to be able to make money, too. I'm only going to take it to X point. I'm not yeah. going to do a full-on restoration. Majority of times, uh, you know, I'll put tires on if 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 they're just awful and I need to be able to sell it. But I'm not going to change tires that are holding air because I'm not going to get the return from it. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? It's uh, yeah. down the line. You can change the tires. But I'm not – if I spend 200 bucks on tires, I'm not going to get $400 out of it. So well, I don't do that. So, and also it snowballs because right. you get tires and then you take the wheels off and you realize you need wheel bearings. That's and then it. when the tire's off, you realize, man, this steering head doesn't feel good. And that's then you're it. restoring a motorcycle. Right. And some motorcycles don't have the value at the end. And then also for me, because I buy a lot of stuff in packages, right? Just like this bike. I got this bike yep. in a yep. package. So... I might buy five motorcycles to get one that I actually want to do stuff with. So those other four, <clears throat> excuse me, I might like this, just get it running so I can sell it with knowing that it's, it is a running motorcycle. It is solid. There's nothing crazy going on with it, um, but it's going to need X, Y, and Z. And yeah. you could take it to the moon, you know, like yeah. the there's so you know, that's what you have to do with some of these bikes. At the end of the day, what we're what we're really doing is we're trying to keep bikes out of the scrapyard um, that are, you know, because not everything is worth parley money yet. Right. Um, and it might be someday, but also there, it doesn't make sense to throw away a bike that just needs a carb clean, the gas yeah. tank cleaned, and some brake work. That's, it, it's, it's so crazy. It just... Just doing the little bit of work to get it to the next level, which is which is what I do. I, I just want to make it to where if somebody sees it, they go, wow, they see potential in it. But if they would have saw it the way I got it, it was garbage. Because exactly. that's the time I get it, it was garbage. I just need to make them a little, look a little bit better so that they want to move on and then go from there. Now, mm -hmm. there's some that I do more of a restoration on, if you will. But um, – Majority of them, it's how can I get them from from where I am to there, and I'm okay with majority of the motorcycles I buy for five hundred dollars or less. So mm -hmm. I'm okay selling them for fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars after they're running and riding. The lights work, all that stuff. You're going to need to do some work on it. Believe me, but it's it. You're further down the road, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. Yep. You know. Plus, uh, plus, I figured out that that is uh, an easy sweet spot to sell motorcycles without uh, having to deal with um, a lot of tire kickers. Fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars. Somebody's going to show up and buy it today. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. It's when it comes to selling motorcycles, it's your buyer pool for that has two thousand dollars or less is here, and then. Yeah. It gets narrow as you go up in yeah. money. And then, you know, there's certain thresholds. Like for me, it's like there's the $5,000 yeah. threshold and then the $10,000 one. That ten to 40000 yeah. is tough because yeah. for cash buyers. Um, above that, there's a whole different category of collectors and people. Yeah. And then the money, it doesn't so much matter. Yeah. You know, the only reason that BMW sells $30,000 motorcycles and Harley Davidson sells $50,000 CVOs is a little thing called financing, That's <laughs> you right. know? Um, but as far as people pay, you know, writing checks for stuff, yeah. it's, it's a whole different game than selling motorcycles. And I'm not knocking the finance thing. I am super thankful for that. 
I was a finance manager for a few years <laughs> and uh, I enjoy living in a house. So that's right. <laughs> you know, and also people need motorcycles and you know, they, it makes sense. So yeah. not knocking it, just saying that's how it happens. Yeah. We have been exploring a couple of finance companies for Moto Nexus, but that's something that we're going to work on in the future. Um, that's awesome. A lot of the stuff that we have going on, getting listed right now in the next couple of weeks is, you know, stuff that uh, typically shouldn't need financing. We'll see. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Awesome. We, we, we do have a couple wild cards that we're hoping to list. So we'll see. There's a few high dollar ones in the works, but we're, we're talking with a couple of collectors as well, as far as doing a full collections, but that's, oh, that's, uh, awesome. that's coming soon. Oh, that'd be awesome. That'd be great. Yeah. I look forward to it. And we're going to list all the, uh, another cool thing that we're doing that everyone's going to be really excited about is we're going to do a couple of vintage bike giveaways. What you talking about? So I'm, I'm working with, I'm working on a deal right now for the first one. And hopefully I'll have that bike in the next week or two. And we're going to do a full on giveaway with it. And I'll, I'll post like how to sign up for it. It's going to be yeah. free. But yeah, somebody's gonna somebody's gonna win a free motorcycle, and it's gonna be awesome. I love it. I love free motorcycles. Those are yeah. those may be my favorite. You know, <laughs> I love I love just discovering more about people. And thanks for sharing this Moto Nexus, and I look forward to seeing it grow. The uh, the one motorcycle you had and you sold, the one that got away, the one that you moved on, the one you wish you had back. Is there one or a handful of them? Well. Yeah, here's the thing. I fall in love with all these bikes, right? And even stuff that I didn't even know that I wanted, I kind of sometimes will end up falling in love with, and it just happens yeah. that way. Um, one of the bikes that, and I'm going to buy another one at some point, and it's not that it's a, a super special bike, but it was my first street bike I got when I was like 12 years old, was a 1975 Yamaha RD350. Oh, yeah. um, basically an air-cooled Banshee motor. Yeah. And now, mind you, this is in like the mid-2000s or early 2000s or something. So back then, those bikes were not worth very much money at all. And I fixed it up and I, I, got, I sold it because I wanted a cross rocket. So <laughs> I sold that and I had a 400EX quad that I had since I was like, 14 or something like I bought with like 4-H money type of deal. <laughs> um, and I got a 2001 CBR 600 F4i when I was, I think I was 16 when I got that. So we're talking 2005-ish. <laughs> um, and it was a stunt bike. It was like, I'm yeah. so lucky. I am so lucky that I didn't kill myself on that thing. Oh. So that, that RD has like this special place in my heart where I'm like, I want to get one of those again, um, just to, you know, just to have it to cruise around on. And yeah. I have a, I have a few bikes that are like, just, you know, you have like an emotional connection to stuff randomly. So I have a yeah. 1987 Suzuki Quadzilla 500. So oh, it's wow. a 500 single two stroke four wheeler. When I was a kid, I was obsessed with four wheelers and that, and I would, Dirt Wheels magazine every month. I'd read that thing <laughs> front to back ten times. Um, and the Quadzilla was so such a beast. And we were driving one time, and we saw one in a front yard. And I made my mom stop, but of course you can get it, whatever. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's like once I started making money, and I found one. Um, I bought it, and I just I just love that thing. And it's not like it's worth thirty grand or whatever, but to me, um, it's special. So. Yeah, those those RD two three fifties are awesome. Yeah, they're, oh, they're yeah they're they're so quick, they're they're shockingly quick, and I've always equated them to uh, dating a really hot chick that was batshit crazy, right? <laughs> you never know when they're going to lose their mind because the power band comes on late. Well, yeah, isn't that the beauty of two strokes? Like, <laughs> well, you know. Least, at least two-stroke dirt bikes, the power band is lower. Yeah, especially the big bore bikes like the right. five hundred. Yeah, you know, 
everyone's like scared of these things, but they only go as fast as you tell them to. And they yeah. do have so much torque that if you don't try to ride it like a 125, it's not yeah. as crazy. The thing is, it can get away from you. That's where that gets right. scary is when you unintentionally give it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. So, so I rebuilt uh, uh, an RD2. Well, it was a R5 250 yeah. Yamaha during COVID. Ended up getting it from a guy. He said the engine needed to be rebuilt. And it had the shifter had been flipped around. And sure enough, you'd put it in first. It would idle like a champ. And it'd rev really good. You put it in first, it'd fall on its face. Well, come to find out, once COVID hit, I said, let me go ahead and see see if I can build this thing with only stuff we have here. So it was my my quarantine project. And I brought it outside to pressure washing because it had been sitting in the corner of the shop. The shifter was backwards. So when you put it in the first, you were putting it in the sixth. Ah, that's hilarious. So I, I, I got this motorcycle for dirt. <laughs> Because the guy thought it had to be rebuilt. Didn't have to be rebuilt. You just need to know the shift pattern. Yeah. And and this thing, and this was just a 250, but at about 4,500 RPMs, it would lose its mind. The power yeah. band would kick in, and you're like, holy crap, front wheel's off the ground. You're like, I didn't know that was going to happen. It's, you know, the, a 250 two-stroke is like a, a CB550 power. You know, mm -hmm. like it's... You can't think about it the same, right? So, uh, yeah, we finished it up. We, it was a fun, it was a fun build. We enjoyed that. We so we built it. That one? I did, and uh, didn't mean to, but uh, kind of accidentally sold it. So we built it up. It had uh, came with a tracker seat, fiberglass tracker seat. So we built it. We painted it with uh, wheel paint from the Tribe Spitfire that I had because leftover. Again, it was only leftover is what we used. Yeah. So silver, and we ended up having some 2K clear. We painted that. We made some decals for it with the little Cricut uh, decal machine. And uh, we put it on. A guy came by. This was a couple of months later, right, when it kind of opened up. We were having some work done around the house. And he came by, and the garage doors open. This is maybe two months into it, six weeks into it. Uh, he came by, saw the motorcycles, and he saw the 250, and he goes, hey, what are you doing with that? Is it for sale? I'm like, yes. And what do you want for it? And I gave him a number, and sure enough, he bought it. So I wasn't even yeah. trying to sell it. I just had the garage door open. I have a TTR90 electric yep. start, and I sold it to – I bought it in a package, and I, you know, carb – mini bike stuff, carb clean, yep. battery, yep. air in the tires, sold it to this to this dude that lives – down by the beach, doesn't have a yard, I guess. So mm -hmm. they would go down to Hollister and ride and all that. Yep. Um, and I ran into him at Cars and Coffee like <laughs> four or five years later because he has yeah. a couple of beamers. And um, we, you know, got to talk. Oh man, do you still have that that ninety that I sold you for your kid? And he's like, Yeah. He goes, Do you want to buy it back? And I was like, Yeah. Well, like, what do you mean? And he goes, Well, he goes, We put probably two tanks of gas through it, but it's such a production to load up and go to Hollister yeah. to just a ride that we're not really into it. He goes, I'll sell it to you for what you sold it to me for. I was like, you know, fair enough. Like, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. And now I, now I kept it because you know, you know how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you mentioned falling in love with these damn, I, it's the reason why I can't go to the pound. Right. right? Cause I'll end up with 10 dogs. It's the well, same thing with these motorcycles. You know, and, and the weirdest ones, you know, like I, I never expected that because my, my lane is very, very defined. Uh, 60s to middle 70s is kind of my, my favorite, my sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Easy, nice, easy lane to live in. And then that damn 83 GPZ 1100 came my way as a, uh, and, and I've fallen in love with this motorcycle based on what it, what uh, not just that motorcycle but all the motorcycles in that era that those muscle bikes when they were coming yeah. into how fast can we get these things to go how much horsepower everything was was a challenge to uh just throwing down the gauntlet that mine yeah. was getting more horsepower my quarter mile times faster all of this is what they were those japanese motorcycles were racing for 
And I love that that what what they were doing. Mm-hmm. I'm not the guy that wants to ride fast. That's not what I want to do. You know, uh, I, I guess if I was started like you did at 16 years old, going you know 100 yeah. miles an hour with your hair on fire, that'd be different. You know, I'm 56 years old. I don't want to go faster than that. Uh, you know, 56 I, I, miles an hour is good. Yeah. And, you know, things change when you got a family. Like, I'm 36. I got two kids. Uh-huh. Like, you know, that's why, that's why I'm a huge fan of little bikes. So one of the, the, one of the favorite bikes that I own is a Honda Ground. Um, and I love it because I can ride it wide open all the time. And you, can, you can't break the law on the thing. It only goes like 50 miles an hour. Right. So you're not going to jail, right? Um, but man, it is a hoot to ride. You know, they're, they're so much fun. I did a, a <laughs> an episode with a guy just talking about this that you mentioned it. it it's small displacement motorcycles. I think that there's something about riding slow bikes fast. Yeah, right. Totally. That, that, that you feel that that's a whole different deal. I did a talking motorcycles episode with a guy, Nigel Cox from the UK, and him and his friends yeah. rode the the monkey bikes. From the top of the, as far north on in, on the island of UK, Scotland, all the way down to as far south as you can go in Wales, on these monkey bikes, which is insane. I, you know, I, I saw that, and I yeah. was like, "That is the coolest thing!" Like, I love that. Yeah, twelve hundred miles on this little bike that's going to do fifty miles an hour, and but but there's something about that. There's something about just getting out and going you don't need an adventure bike you don't need a big harley bagger to go do this stuff you can just jump on what you have and just go find out where the day takes you i i rode my 2006 zx6 636 coast to coast because that's the only motorcycle that i had and it totally did it just fine it's you that's the the limiting factor but i was like 21 years old so yeah i actually moved out west on that bike with a backpack i got rid wow. of all my stuff what I, I put what i could fit in the backpack and i jumped on the bike and headed out like when when i did the 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 one with pete from pete's classic cycle and he told the story about his dad's journey riding a, a z1 from um Canada down to they went to California. I guess they turned around somewhere, Los Angeles. But his buddy that went with him was on a Honda CB three fifty. Yeah, of the yeah. same era. You know, it's like in the early seventies. Yeah. Neck, it just nothing out front, and and just went and, and and there's something about that. So you can do it. You know, when you rode this, this is maybe an interesting uh, sidebar, but I love it. When you rode your. Uh, your bike coast to coast. Were you by yourself? What was yep. the uh, by myself? So- no smartphone, no GPS. Um, I had a map with me, and then I was taping directions to my gas tank. Um, mm-hmm. But I also didn't have like I had a stop lined up in South Carolina, so I went from yep. Ohio to South Carolina because I had a buddy down there. So I had that kind of plan, but heading west, I didn't have to be at this point to sleep. I just rode until I didn't want to ride anymore, and then that's where I stopped. The one day I was in um, Oklahoma, right, and I think I stayed in Oklahoma City. It was was the longest leg I've ever done on a motorcycle, Um, and I rode all the way to Phoenix just because I just didn't – I just didn't want to stop, man. I just, yeah. I was on the 40 and I was jamming. I was trying to do like around a hundred the whole time. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think I ended up getting almost a thousand miles and I didn't do like an iron butt thing. I wish I yeah. would have like actually, but it wasn't planned. I was yeah. just, there's nothing in that stretch of the country really. Yeah. And I knew people in Phoenix and stuff and that was where I was going. So yeah. I just rode all day, like 15 hours. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that's the, uh, you know, what I learned, my, my first uh, distance ride was when I rode the GPZ to Colorado. Mm-hmm. And I, I think if, if, when I do the next one, it's, 
the only stop I'm going to have planned is when I stop back at home. Yeah. And, but yep. not a day in mind. Uh, just to let Carrie know that I'm going to be gone, you know, five, six, seven days. I don't know. We'll figure it out on the way. Yeah. And just wherever the, the day takes you, I think that's where the, I think that's where the, the magic in on a motorcycle is because it's not the most efficient means of transportation. Yeah. And also it's like one of those things where once you get a, it takes a day or two to, of doing that to like get in a mode, but it's, it's very freeing. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, even my wife and I did back in 2017 before, before I opened the brick and mortar and before we mm -hmm. did the kid thing, right. Uh, we jumped in my big diesel truck and I with a stack of cash and a ramp because I was looking for motorcycles to buy. And we did 18 states in 7,700 oh. miles. And we had two stops planned because there was a wedding in Ohio that we were going to mm -hmm. and then a wedding in California. That's and awesome. it was the coolest thing to just, you know, we were hitting National Park. We knew we wanted yeah. to go places, but not having a schedule is so so nice and freeing and you yeah. just do whatever you want to do man yeah yeah you know when when i the the first day of the first leg of the trip the first day of the trip i went from from where we are just outside of new orleans to memphis right at about 400 miles and it was it was perfect if the rest of the trip would have ended up there i got into memphis early enough to where i could ride around memphis i rode up and down beale street you know, I was able to kind of touristy around, uh, went and had barbecue across from the Lorraine Hotel, and uh, it was awesome. Everything was perfect. I wandered around till I found the hotel that I wanted to stay in, which ended up being a great spot, and everything was, was perfect. I was like, wow, this is the way the trip is going to be. It's going to be amazing. You get to wander around, and then, uh, you know, life hit me the next day when it broke down. But uh, yeah. But what do you expect? That was the first well, 400 you know, miles on it. The, <laughs> that's the difference between riding a $300 bike and a $30,000 bike. Yeah, you that's know? right. You know, so. <laughs> Buy the ticket, take but, the ride, baby. I know. You need to find a bike out here, fly out, I'll pick you up at the airport, and we'll tune it up in my garage here, and then you can ride it back. That'd be a good ride. I, I, I do. And ideally, uh -huh. it's a... Uh, Early, uh, middle, early 80s, uh, Goldwing, Aspen Cade, something like that, with all the bells and whistles. So, oh, man. Uh, you, you, should, you, should with, have told, oh. you should have told me that. <laughs> Goldwings are the number one motorcycle that I get offered for free. Oh, I my get, God. I get offered so many Goldwings for free, and I tell everybody the same thing. Thank you, but no thank you. Um, yeah. Just because they're huge. And it, you know, if I was playing, like if I had more time and I was playing around type of thing, yeah. but at the end of the day, I, I do have to make money. Um, yeah. So I have to be like selective and then space is always an issue. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to mitigate that, but like every time I add space, I fill it. So, you know, how that goes. Yeah. And but, so the know. gold wing, the gold wing is not the one I want to keep. I just want to road trip it. I just yeah. want to road trip it and be done only because again, like I mentioned with the, the GPZ and the muscle bikes, this bike was this, the early gold wings, not, not the real early gold wings when they were still naked, right? They were just building big bikes. They yeah. just said, they just put a different engine, a bigger bike, but the middle early eighties, they really became purpose built for head out on the highway, just hit yeah. the highway and just go. And it was, I, I appreciate that in what they were doing with that. And I just want a road trip because I'm the same thing. There's no way I could keep one of those in my garage. It might as well park our car in there. Totally. It's, so I yeah. need to buy it somewhere else, road trip at home, and then it's going to be gone when uh, a well, couple of weeks later. You should do that, and then we'll list it on Moto Nexus, and we'll donate the money to charity. I like you it. Know? I yeah. love it. That, that would be yeah. super cool. We'll do like a no-reserve auction and yeah. just donate the money to charity, and, and that'd be fun. And with yeah, like with us, do we don't we don't charge any listing fees or anything. So it'd be yeah, it'd be super easy. And I'm gonna be uh I'm gonna be looking for a gold wing because I, I really think it'd be fun to have you come out and we'll tinker and, and hang out a little bit and then you can hit the road and make some cool content and 
and yeah, we'll we'll sell it for charity or something. Yeah, yeah. Don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> yeah. Right on. This is awesome. This cool. is awesome, man. Thank, thank, thanks. This was perfect. Yeah. And um, you know, for everyone out there watching, if you could go to motonexus.com, sign up. Uh, we're gonna be having some amazing bikes hit the market this upcoming week. And we have a lot of cool stuff in the works. We also have our own social media where we're starting to do. My partner is a very, very uh, detailed Honda collector and restore. His CB750 is one, the quail and all that. He's mm. super, very into it. And he is making some great how-to videos. So we're, we're trying to spread some free information to sell on our website. We have no seller fees. We charge a 5% buyer's premium. So we're by far better than anyone out there and we are true enthusiasts. So when you're working with us, we're going to talk, you're going to talk to a real person on the phone. This isn't, you know, a company that they don't care about you. Like right. this is what we do. So yeah, hop on Moto Nexus and uh, let's sell your bike. I love it. Cool. Thank you. All right, Eric. Good talking okay, to man. you. You have a good one. We'll talk to you soon. Take it easy. Thank you. Bye-bye.